Okay, happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to the Young Professionals Association event today. Uh, a little bit about the um, association. Um, it's a premier networking group comprised of recent grad Roosevelt graduates and alumni across all industries. The university aims to provide this as a value added opportunity for our graduates to network and further promote their degrees. So um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jessica Mueller. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Roosevelt. And I appreciate you being here for our uh, YPA Pro Devo session, which will cover the best ways to navigate job postings, research companies, present an attractive portfolio, um, and do follow-up, uh, um, uh, successful follow-up and find your per perfect match in terms of company. Uh, so please stay muted during the presentation and use the chat for comments and questions, and they will be answered at the end. I'll be monitor monitoring them for Steve. And uh, before I introduce Steve, our speaker, I also would like to welcome uh, uh, one of our YPA co-chairs in attendance today. Uh, Dina is a 2018 grad and human resources partner at Perker Elmer Incorporated and is actually a mentee of Steve's. and. Um, shared is sharing him with us today so we definitely appreciate that thank you dina and let me see if one other person's on the call nancy may also be joining us a little bit later uh and kersia she's our associate director of career services and um consider following up with her and the office as alumni have access to to their office and services even after uh graduation so it's a great benefit for you to utilize as a grad so Let's get started with today's presentation, which is Let's Find Your Perfect Match. It's hosted by Stephen Rosenblum. Um, thank you, Steve, for being here today. A little bit about Steve is uh, he is a dedicated human resources professional and has 20, over 25 years uh, experience in various HR roles, including regional management, training, su succession planning, diversity program, leadership, and talent acquisition. In addition to his experience in recruiting, Steve has experienced job searching firsthand over the years in his own job searches, landing positions, and re-emerging back into unemployment more than a dozen times over the past 20 years. His passion for helping people has made him a highly sought after speaker and respected professional, driving him to continuously help counsel and mentor others by speaking at an executive summit on change leadership, numerous job clubs and conferences, participating in area resume reviews, attending networking functions, and meeting one-on-one -on -one with hundreds of people in support of their transitional, transitional efforts. Steve has been intimately involved in leading change and partnering with senior executives and others to support com company growth, infrastructure, employee retention, for, and performance optimization. Some of the companies he's worked for include Sears, DeVry, Presentation Service, Services slash Audiovisual, Kraft Foods, Career Education Corporation, U.S. Cellular, InfoSci, InfoSystem, InfoSci, um, Ryerson's, SAC Wireless, The Room Place, Painters USA, Lucid Motors, and Yahweh IA, which on a separate note, I, I realize that's you are what you eat. And I don't know if that's it the is. company motto, but um, <laughs> currently Steve serves as vice president of the board of education for Schaumburg Palatine Township High School District 211 and as an HR consultant for Salo LLC and as partner advisor and deliver executive at level five partners providing recruiting efforts and HR consultation for several companies across the country. So um, a lot to share with this group today. I'm so excited you're here. Um, Steve, thanks for being here with us today and the floor is now yours. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a rather sarcastic individual. So Jessica, thank you for that lengthy uh, introduction. That concludes our presentation for today. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so Jessica, thank you very much for hosting. Uh, and Dina, thank you very much. I blame it all on you for me being here today uh, and inviting me to, to share some of my background and expertise um, with y'all. So, uh, so thank you very much. I am going to share my screen. Um, I do have a presentation. It's going to go between my presentation and Q&A. It's going to go for the, the full hour. Um, so we should finish right at noon. Um, and if, if Jessica, if you can keep an eye on that for me um, as we go through, um, I'm going to be sharing a lot of information with you today. 
And if, please feel free to take notes. Please feel free to screenshot or use your phone and take pictures of screens as I go through them. Um, you should have also received a handout. Uh, it looks kind of like a wheel. It's my three by three method of follow-up, which is what I call my secret sauce. And that's gonna be part of the presentation as well. So we'll cover that when we get to it. But like Jessica mentioned, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat feature and we will go from there. And I just clicked on something already wrong. So here we go, okay. Just one sec. All right. So Jessica, all right, thank you very much. Okay, great. So, um, so welcome everyone. And, um, and really, so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is how to look for work, right? How to find that job. Um, I'm gonna be sharing things from uh, both a candidate perspective and give you some real insight into uh, the recruiting world when you're applying for positions and talking to people and going through interviews, what that looks like for, uh, for the company. So like I said, if you have any questions, use the chat feature, put your questions in there. We'll go through those at the end. Um, and, uh, and I'm also gonna provide my contact information at the end, which will include my email address and my LinkedIn URL. So let's get started. First thing I want you to think about is, um, you know, if, if you're looking for work, the question I ask is, who do you want to be in control of that? Who do you want to be in control? Because really, that it's your life. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in control of my life. I don't want to rely on someone else for that. Being organized is hugely important to that. And that helps you stay motivated. And it helps you um, be successful. So what I'm going to share with you are a lot of things that are going to have you very active in your job search um, and not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring and those kinds of things. So uh, first thing you want to do in your job search and everything I'm going to tell you about today, um, if you've been looking for work for months, if you've been looking for work for days, if you're just starting out to look for a job, it's never too late to start the information I'm going to share with you. I will also give you a guarantee that if you use these things that I'm showing you today, I guarantee they will help you find a job or land a job. I don't know anybody else out there that's making that kind of guarantee, but I'll give you that guarantee. So the first thing you wanna do is think about what do I wanna get done here, right? And, and from an objective perspective, you have to think uh, for timeline, how long can I go looking for work? Well, if you're currently working, how long can I stand this job <laughs> or stay in this job? Or what's the timeline for this job maybe being eliminated? Uh, financially, how long can I go on? Um, maybe you have some new bills that are coming due. Maybe you're unemployed and you're having difficulty paying those bills. Um, or going to the grocery store and, and putting food on the table. So you need to think about how long and what your timeline is to your job search. Also, you need to think about from a sanity perspective. Now, a lot more people are looking for work at home these days. So working at, you know, being at home, if you normally you're out of your house and you have family members who are still home, sometimes you got to think about, okay, now I'm home all the time. How long can this go on, right? You're on each other's backs or um, in each other's way. And, and so you just have to think about how long can that survive uh, from a family perspective. And what I also encourage you to do is set milestones, right? Timelines. I'm gonna review this every 30 days, every 60 days. If six months is how long you think you have before things really start to fall apart, then set some milestones in between the six months, you know, in that six months, so you can keep checking on how things are going. All of you, if you're looking for work, are salespeople. 
you're selling yourselves, right? So with that, you have to have a marketing plan. You have to have strategy. You need collateral. You need marketing material in order to sell, in order to be that salesperson and get that job. You have to think about who's my target audience? Who am I trying to contact and communicate with in search of that? Now, I don't know how many of you have already been to either uh, the career services um, department or job networking groups or job clubs, but there's a thing called an elevator speech. You may have heard about this before. And an elevator speech is, I like to think of the movie Tommy Boy, one of my favorite movies, um, where the, the, the main characters at the end of the movie or towards the end of the movie want to sell brake parts to the CEO of a big um, automotive parts store. And they're sitting out in front of the corporate office for their, their company and in walks the, the CEO and owner of the company who's named after. And they feel, okay, we need to be able to make a pitch directly to him. And how do they do that? Well, they get on the elevator with him and the elevator doors closed. Now they have, <laughs> they have undivided attention on this elevator ride up to the main floor of the company. And during that time, they can give their pitch, their sales pitch to the head of the company. So an elevator speech is giving your sales pitch. Now people a lot of times say, well, how long can that be? Well, it's as long as an elevator ride. Now, I'm not talking the Sears Tower elevator, because when I worked at the Sears Tower, it would take me 20 minutes to get from the ground floor to my office on the 67th floor, because I had to go to the 33rd floor, change elevators, go to the 66th floor, change elevators to go one more floor. I'm talking a regular building <laughs> riding in that elevator. So it could be 30 seconds. It could be 60 seconds. It could be two minutes. And what you want to say in your elevator speech is answer a couple of very important questions. Why are you looking for work? And what do you want to do? Those are the two things that need to be answered in an elevator speech. Okay? So I want you to think long and hard about those two things. Why are you looking for work? And what do you want to do? And I encourage you to write your elevator speech down on a piece of paper and then practice it, practice it, practice it until it just rolls off the tip of your tongue every time somebody asks you that. Because whether you're meeting somebody at a barbecue, you're meeting somebody, I actually met somebody in the line at the ticket counter at an airport, we were both checking in. Um, you can meet somebody at a job fair, somebody's going to interview you, they're going to ask you those questions. So two big questions, okay? So think about that, that's called an elevator speech, and you need to have that prepared um, and comfortable for you to answer those questions. We're not even going to start looking for work for a little while here during my presentation, because there's a lot of things that you have to do up front, right? Like that elevator speech and getting your collateral. So part of your collateral is having the right tools. And one of those tools is your resume, right? So how many styles should you have? Well, um, when I think of styles, I think of the format of the resume, not how many totally different resumes you may have, you could have, I would say, no more than four different resumes. Some people may only have one, and that's perfectly fine. Some people may have different ones depending on what kind of job they're applying for, right? And here's my thought on different kinds of resumes, different, um, different things going for different kinds of jobs. The experiences that you've had don't change right? The last job you had is the last job you had. It doesn't all of a sudden move further down your list or change it to highlight instead of doing one job, you're doing a different job, okay? So those things don't change. What can change is how you highlight things within those jobs or highlight at the top of your resume what you're looking to do based on the type of job you're applying for. 
Okay. For instance, in human resources, which is my area, if I'm applying for a job in recruiting, I'll move all the recruiting and talent acquisition things up in wherever they are. If I'm applying for a job in training, I'll change those things around within their section so that the training stuff bubbles up to the top. Because as much as we want to think that a recruiter is going to look at my beautiful resume from top to bottom, and I'm sure you've heard this before, and it is totally the truth, the average time that a recruiter will look at your resume is between 6 and 15 seconds. Okay? Most recruiters will spend six seconds looking at your resume to decide whether or not they want to read any more of it. Okay, so you want to do something on your resume that I call pop at the top, which is the first section of your resume, not your name and your address and your phone number, <laughs> but the next section, you want it to pop as to what are you looking for? Because a recruiter is going to look at that and decide whether or not to even look at your experience or your education information. Okay. That's the truth. And I remember telling somebody that and they got really mad at me. They're like, what do you mean? You should be looking at my whole resume. Hey, right now I've got 20 open positions. And each one of those positions has between 100 and 250 people applying for it. I don't have time to go through every one of those resumes from top to bottom. So I'm going to do a quick glance. If it interests me, great. I'm going to keep going. Maybe I'll move it to a pile to look at it later. Otherwise, I move it off to the side for rejection. Okay. So pop at the top is really important. Moving things around within your resume are really important. Now, when you talk about styles and format, I outlined here three styles you need. You need to have a copy of your resume in Word. You need to have it in PDF and you need to have it in a text file. Here's why. Word is going to be like your working document, right? If you're moving things around or whatever, you're going to do that in Word. Some people prefer you to send it to them in Word, which is okay. Some people prefer you send it to them in a PDF file because maybe they have um, a system with a firewall and it doesn't like Word document because maybe there's a virus in there or whatever. And also you should have it as a text or .txt file. Well, what's a text file? A lot of people ask me because everybody seems to know Word and PDF. A text file strips all the pretty things off of your resume, all the pretty bullets, any graphs, any, anything that's bold, italicized, takes all that off and it looks like you put it together on an old fashioned typewriter, okay? And what you want to do that for is some applicant systems when you um, upload your resume as a file to their system. Some of their systems that are out there, they're getting better, but there's still systems out there that don't like all those nice formatted graphs, graphics and things like that that you may have put in your resume. So what happens is if you send it over as a Word or a PDF file and upload it into their system, it makes it the world's longest run on sentence or it takes some of those pretty bullets and other things that you may have put in there and it makes them look terrible, just terrible. And if I'm a recruiter and I open a resume and it's the world's longest run on sentence from top to bottom, all one big run on sentence, I'm gonna reject it right away. I don't have time to try to figure out where every sentence and section starts and stops as I'm reading around on it. It's going in the, in the trash. But if you send it over as a text file, it will keep it the way that it looks on your computer as a text file. It's a secret. That's a secret for you, right? So save it as a Word doc, then save it as a .txt file, then open it as a .txt file and fix it. Because just like in the system that doesn't like Word, saving it as a text file, it doesn't like Word. So it doesn't know what to do with some of those things that may be on the Word document. But you can fix it on your computer and then resave it as a .txt and then use that when it asks you to upload your resume. Um, and some systems even say upload it as a .txt file. So those are my, the three styles that everyone should have their resumes.
Okay. But again, if you make a change on the Word document, then you need to resave it as a PDF and resave it and fix it under the .txt. So huge secret there for you. Okay. Tracking method. So you know you're going to have this beautiful document. Now you're going to start applying to jobs, and when you do, you need to keep track. And you'll see more of that when I get to my follow-up method, the three by three. And there's different ways that work for different people. I don't care how you do it. You can use a spreadsheet, right? Use Excel or whatever you access, whatever you want, and, and keep it on a on a spreadsheet. Um, you can just keep track of it in in computer files. Keep track of it on your phone or on paper, if you're a paper kind of person, whichever works best for you, as long as you're keeping track, okay? Uh, next, I wanna talk about office space. Well, there's different reasons to have different office spaces, right? One is so you can spend time researching and applying for jobs. The second is for um, following up and for maybe phone interviews, right? So there's different places to do different things. The public library, and I live in Schaumburg, and the Schaumburg Public Library, the main branch, is the Northeast Illinois Regional Business Center for the entire state library system. It's a beautiful library if you haven't been out there. Um, you can use conference rooms at your local libraries for free. My favorite four-letter word, free, right? Especially when you're looking for work. You can use those conference rooms. They're, they're um, able to be reserved for up to like two hours. They have internet. They have a plug for your phone or your computer. There's a table, there's chairs, and there's privacy. What a great place for you to get out of the house, especially if you have other people there um, and not be distracted and be able to do phone interviews in a very quiet, concentrated, focused area. Um, I used library, I used public libraries for my job search quite a bit for the very, that very reason is to get out of the house. Second is if you have a really nice home office, you need to have a home office setting. It's really hard to look for a job at the foot of your bed or even on the dining room table because you find yourself cleaning up every night and then putting everything back out in the morning when you're not using the dining room table or the floor, in, if you have an apartment, on the floor or on the coffee table. Um, really, you wanna set yourself some kind of separate work area, even if it's a fold-up TV tray, right? And you're able to just pick up that whole TV tray and move it into the corner when you're not looking for work. And at least it'll be out of the way, okay? And other places you could also use for your job search. I've listed a couple here, coffee shops, right? Starbucks has Wi-Fi um, and fast food chains. I'm a fast food aholic. So all McDonald's have Wi-Fi as well, <laughs> but you don't want to do a phone screen in a Starbucks, right? You're in the middle of a phone screen and all of a sudden you start hearing them yell out the type of drink that they just prepared and are putting on the counter. Not very professional when you're looking for work and on a phone screen. So please don't do coffee shops and fast food chains, those kinds of places for phone screens. You really need to find a private area, okay? Also, uh, I just thought of this, hotels, right? Hotel lobbies have free Wi-Fi for, for guests in the hotel. Some of them have no passwords. So anybody who's in the hotel can use their Wi-Fi. Um, but a lot of them do require a password or your room number and your name, those kinds of things. But that's another location where you may find um, interest to be able to use for your job search. So think about that. All right, we're still preparing. We're still preparing. Um, equipment. You want to make sure you have office supplies. That includes paper, especially if you're going to follow my three by three. Um, you might need paper, a computer. Um, pens, pencils, maybe staples, paper clips, those kinds of things. Um, you, you will need internet access, and I think everybody here knows that. Oh, uh, I forgot another place you can use. School, right? So you can go to school. Um, their um, career services area, um, sh you should have free Wi-Fi at school, and you can use that um, and their spaces as well. And of course, the library at school. Um, you need to have some kind of binder or filing system to keep track. I'll share mine with you in a minute. Uh, personal business cards. 
if you do not have a personal business card, you need to get some, okay? I've had the same personal business card for 20 years, <laughs> uh, 21 years actually, but you should have a business card that has your name, your address, your phone number, your email address, and if you so choose your LinkedIn URL. Now, a lot of people are like, but I don't want to have my, my um, address out there for everybody to see. Well, business cards, you're not going to put your business cards on a bulletin board at Starbucks or on a table in a stack for people just to come and take. You're going to selectively hand out these business cards. And if there's somebody you don't want to have all that information, don't give them your card, right? Just say, hey, listen, here's, you know, let me send you my phone number. Let me call you and you can grab my phone number or let me give you my email address. And you don't have to give them all that information. But you're not going to carry your resume around in your pocket. At least I don't think you are. I never did. But if you're out there networking and you, you can even unexpectedly run into someone that you want to share your contact information with, whip out a business card and hand them a business card. Okay. A lot of those can be, can be done either free or discounted. Retail stores like um, Office Depot and, um, and Staples, uh, they can make business cards for you right there. Or you can go to Vistaprint, which I love Vistaprint. Um, they're usually running sales and for like $9.99, you can get like 250 business cards. That's where I get mine from. Um, they have like 10,000 different designs that you could pick from. Um, you could pick two-sided if you want to spend a little bit more money, um, but definitely you want to have that as something that you keep in your pocket, okay? All right. All right, let's start doing some research. Gather marketplace information and target companies. So what's a target company? A target company is if you died and went to professional heaven, where do you want to do that, right? Where do you want to spend the rest of your professional life working? Well, that's what a target company is. I went to a networking group meeting once and people at the meeting were going around introducing themselves. It was kind of like professional speed dating. And people were going around introducing themselves and saying, you know, who they are. They were answering those two questions. I said, you need to keep in your elevator speech. Um, you know, why are they looking for work and what are they looking for? <laughs> and, um, and then they were also saying who their target companies were. Um, and so, you know, people should have around a half a dozen to a dozen target companies. Those are companies that you're going to always keep in the forefront of your research. You're going to maybe subscribe to their, um, their, um, their feeds, their, um, you know, their automated feeds for news and press releases and things like that. Um, there are also companies that you're going to continue to try to network into because, oh my gosh, I so want to work at this company. They have my values. Um, I love what they're doing. Uh, they're stable. Um, or they're, they're a startup, and I find that very exciting. I love the risk. I love the upside uh, from financial perspective that might come with getting equity in the organization, all those kinds of things. So I want you to think about a half a dozen to a dozen companies that you really, really want to work for, okay? Those will not change unless something happens. Like for instance, um, right now, I probably would not be looking for a job at Sears. I was there almost 16 years, right? And I worked there when Sears was the number one retailer in the world and everything was great and we were opening stores and everybody wanted to work there. Well, now, as you know, they're much smaller. There's none left in Illinois. They're going through a lot of challenges as an organization. So if Sears was one of those companies that, oh, they're always on my list, you need to look at the market. You need to look at, is something going on at that company? Maybe they went through a, a tough patch. Maybe something happened um, legally with that company that you're like, you know what? Now I don't feel so good working at that company. You could take them off your list, okay? I went to this networking group meeting and we went around and, and people were asked, what's your target companies? And I'll never forget, somebody said, my target companies this week 
are, and I thought this week, do you change your tar companies every week? That's not a target company. What that is, is that's a company that you recently applied for and you're trying to find out who to follow up with. <laughs> so target companies are, are your, your hot list, right? And you're always keeping an eye on that. And then you wanna start getting word out. Okay. When I start look, started originally looking for work um, after my first job at Sears for almost 16 years, I was embarrassed. Back in those days, people weren't out of work, right? Everybody thought if you're looking for work, something's wrong with you. Um, so you kind of would mumble or, or not be so, so boisterous on, on the fact that you're looking for a job. Now that's totally changed, right? People are out there, they're communicating with each other, they're helping each other find jobs. Um, so you got to get your message out and you got to get it out wholeheartedly, right? So here are some of the ways that you can get the word out, okay? Um, you can do it through networking with job clubs, job fairs. I want to talk about job fairs for a second. A lot of people think job fairs are great if I want to be an insurance or financial advisor, bank teller, sell mattresses. Um, yeah, those are, are typical organizations that you see at a job fair. You, my opinion is you don't go to a job fair to get a job. You go to a job fair to network. You look at the list of companies that are going to be at that job fair and you identify those that you think would be really good for you to uh, maybe get into. And you want to go to their booths and meet the person who's there because a lot of times the person who's there is the recruiter or the hiring manager or a branch manager. And it's a contact at these companies. So you want to get their business card, give them your business card. So when you do follow up with them, they're not like, who the heck are you, right? You could say, I met you at the job fair and I'm looking to network because I'm very interested in working at your company. Okay, so that's why you go to job fairs, right? You're not going there. And a lot of people do go there. But my opinion is a job fair is for networking, not that I'm going to give them my resume, they're going to give it a once over, do a quick screen, and then sign me up on a sheet for for the interviews going on tomorrow at their office. Some people do that. But really, the advantage of them is for networking. You can network online with LinkedIn. You can network online through job boards, right? Um, professional associations that are specific to the industry or the type of work you want to do are great. They also, professional associations have lunches, they have webinars, they have meetings. A lot of those are either free for job searchers or you can go to the first one for free. So take advantage of that to go to these meetings and programs that they have and network with other people in that association community programs, churches, libraries have programs, the local colleges, Roosevelt and others, community colleges have programs in specific industries that you can take advantage of and network with. Um, there's conferences, conventions, and meetings. So one of the professional associations that I'm involved in has a fall summit every year. One of the things that you might look at is, you know, people say, oh, those conferences are expensive. I'm looking for work. I can't afford to pay to go to a conference or a convention. Volunteers often get in for free. Something to think about, right? My thought is the best place to volunteer is at the registration desk. Why? Because usually it closes down once the convention or the conference kicks off. <laughs> right? And if you're getting in for free because you're doing volunteer work, if you volunteer early in the morning to help with registration, then when it, the conference actually kicks off and registration dies down and closes down, you can head off to the conference and network with other people who either you've been registering or are out there at the conference. So think about that. Um, I always thought, oh, God, I can't pay $750 or $1,500 to go to a conference. You can as a volunteer. Okay. So as you're applying for jobs, now we're going to start applying for jobs. There's this thing that I call my three by three follow up, follow up methodology. I created it. It is guaranteed to get you activity in your job search. 
okay? Guaranteed. You, you need to be cautious on that too, but we're gonna talk about that right now. So um, you should have received prior to this presentation uh, a slide um, that's my three by three follow-up. I'm gonna flip over to that right now. Uh, let's see, where is it? I'm gonna flip over to that on my screen so that we can all look at it and find it. Sorry. Hold on just a moment as I go grab it. Steve, you want me to pull it up? If you don't mind. I know I have it, I just have to flip over to it, but if you, do, if you do, that'd be great. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so this is my, my secret sauce of job search, okay? The number one place where job searchers fail in their job search is by not following up. People apply for jobs and then wait for the phone to ring, right? I hear from people all the time, oh, I applied for 20 jobs last week and I didn't get a single phone call. Well, that's called job application. That's not job search, okay? Part of job search is following up. And this, my friends, this will set you apart from everybody else looking for work, okay? Besides your, your wonderful skills and background and, and all that great stuff. This will set you apart from all the other people. So quick story, in 2001, I was looking for a job and I found a great opportunity as recruiting manager for a company called Prime Code. They were a cell phone company that got bought by US Cellular. I applied for the job through Monster Board and um, the company did not have an applicant system. They literally printed every single resume of everybody who applied to the company. And there were 350 people who applied for that job at PrimeCo. I applied online and called the head of HR to start my three by three follow-up method. So my applying online was where you see that light green, at least it's light green on my, on my screen, top box called initiate contact. You can initiate a contact in a variety of ways. You can meet somebody at a program. You can get referred to someone through networking. You can post online, you can apply, or you could just cold call into an organization. That's an initial contact, okay? Let's say you apply for a job online and now you're gonna sit back and wait for somebody to call, right? Well, what I want you to do is write down or print off the fact that you did that. You could print off the job posting. You can, on a piece of paper, write down who you spoke to, who you met, where you met them, right? And I want you to put that in a file that I call my active file. And I want you to wait three business days for somebody to respond to you, okay? You're gonna wait three business days. During those three business days, you're gonna play private investigator. Okay, you're going to find out either because you already met the person and the person said, yeah, send me your resume, right? And you sent your resume and now you're going to wait three business days or you applied for a job with a company and now you're going to need to follow up with that company to find out some information. I'm going to share my, sec my secret spiel with you in just a sec. So you're going to investigate who do I need to call? Well, I hear all the time, I don't know anybody at that company. Well, yeah, you do. Use LinkedIn, right? 95% of business people have a LinkedIn profile, 95%. So if you don't know anybody at that company, research on LinkedIn and find out someone to call. It could be the hiring manager. It could be the head of that whole department. It could just be someone else that you're going to follow up with by making a phone call, don't use email. Please don't use email. It's too easy to hit the delete button on an email, right? But it's not so hard to tell somebody, it's, it's harder to tell somebody on the phone um, that 
you're deleting them, right? So I encourage you to pick up the phone and call the person. Now, if you don't know the person, you're like, I just cannot find the director of this area. Call the company and ask for the director of that area. Call them on the main number, okay? Most companies, with the exception of maybe Walgreens at their corporate office, will ask you if you want to be forwarded to that person, and you're going to, of course, say yes, right? Um, if they say the person's not in right now, would you like their voicemail? The answer is yes, because 99% of people on their voicemails in the office have their name. Hi, you've reached Steve Rosenblum. I can't take your call right now. Well, now you're going to write down Steve Rosenblum because the next time you call, you're going to ask for Steve Rosenblum, right? So you're going to call and it, whether you get the person on the phone or not, here is my two-part spiel that I encourage you to personalize for yourself to use. Here's what I say. I say, hi, my name is Steve Rosenblum. I recently applied for XYZ position, or I would love to talk to you about coming to work there. Um, but more importantly is if you apply for a position, which is gonna be in most of your activity, you're calling for two reasons. I'm calling for two reasons. One, to make sure my resume was properly and legibly received. And second is to see if there's anything I can do to bring my name to the top of the list, okay? Two parts. One is make sure it was received properly, and two, bring my name to the top of the list. This is proven to get you results. It may not be the result you want, right? It may be a, thank you very much, but we picked somebody else. Thank you very much, but we're not filling that anymore. Thank you very much, uh, but you're not what we're looking for, okay? That's much better than sitting and waiting for the phone to ring. I think you would agree with me on that, right? So it's getting you a result. It may be a, a different result. Here's what happened when I called Primeco. Primeco got 350 people applied to that job. They printed every single one of them, huge stack sitting on the recruiter's desk. And I called, talked to the director of HR and gave her my two-part spiel, my two-part spiel. And she said, hold on, let me check. So she walked away from her desk, went to the recruiter and said, do you have a resume for Steven Rosenblum? She had it all printed out alphabetically. She pulled my resume out from the middle of the pack, right? Took it back to her desk, took a look at it, went, hmm, ah, you got a minute? I'm like, sure, right? So she did a really quick phone screen, said, great, I'm giving your information back to my recruiter. I really like your background. I'd like you to come in and interview with me. And I got a job there. Most recruiters, Again, something you probably don't want to hear, are working on multiple jobs. And they ask the manager, or they tell the manager, this is how many position, this is how many candidates I'm going to give you based on how many people applied. So I as a recruiter might pick out six top-notch people to either phone screen or give to the manager. Manager is going to look at them. The manager is going to pick two, maybe three of those six to interview. From those interviews, the manager, I hope, is gonna pick one of them, okay? Well, if I start with the first one that applied out of the, the, let's say 350, and I go through 30, 40, 50 of them and find some really top-notch people, and from those, the manager makes a hiring decision and we hire somebody. If I went through 50, there's 300 others that I never even looked at, right? And I can reject every single one of them because we hired somebody from the first 50. Now, people don't like to hear that, but that's the fact, okay? If only 20 people applied, I'll look at all 20. But if 350 people apply, I don't have time to look at 350 resumes, right? So, so that's why you want to make that phone call and follow up. I will tell you that as a recruiter, on an average week, I get less than one follow-up call. A week. Okay. I was in charge of recruiting for player stores in North America. Less than one follow up call a week for people applying for jobs. Okay. So, so wait the three business days, make the initial call. Now, if you leave a voicemail, that's okay. You're going to leave the same voicemail. 
Hi, my name is Steve Rosenblum. I recently applied for the position at your company and I'm calling for two reasons. One is to make sure my information was received. Second, is there anything I can do to my name to the top of the list? Uh, please give me a call back. Here's my phone number, okay? Now you, you put that back in your active file for three more business days. And guess what? Try again, right? Call the same person the same way, leave the same message with a, hey, I left you a message a few days ago. Here are the two reasons I'm calling, okay? Then if you get the person on the phone, tell them the same thing that you've been leaving on their voicemails, right? Wait three more business days, put it back in your active folder. Wait three more business days and try one more time. This time, don't say, hey, listen, jerk, I left you two voicemails in the, don't do that, right? <laughs> say, you know, something like, I can tell you're really busy. I know how busy of a time it is right now, but I'm really interested in this opportunity. I think I'm a really strong candidate. Um, I left you a couple of voicemails earlier, and I'd really like to, to know, number one, if my information was properly and legibly received, and second, is there anything I can do to bring my name to the top of the list? So I'm going to go a little quicker here. We're almost done. Um, so, um, so you leave that third voicemail, then you move them into what I call a dead file book, right? And I have my dead file book over here on the floor next to me. Um, and you file that that you've, and every time you leave a voicemail, you're gonna write down, here's who I left a voicemail for. Um, here's the time and date that I left a message, right? So you're gonna leave all those things and, um, and you're going to um, move it into your dead file and file it alphabetical by company or organization. And the reason being is you've left three voicemails. Nobody called you back yet. What if two weeks later, somebody does call you back, right? You want to be organized. You want to be able to jump into your dead file book, pull that out based on company name. You have the job, who you talk, who you left voicemail messages for, all that information right there at your fingertips. Okay. Um, a couple of things about this. One is my son was looking for a job and he came running down the hall. He was in his bedroom looking for work and I was in my home office. And he came running down the hall, dad, dad, it worked, it worked. I said, what? He said, I called and I, I spoke to the recruiter and I asked them if they received my, my information and the recruiter said she couldn't find it. She couldn't find it. I said, well, if the recruiter couldn't find it, when were you ever gonna get a call, right? Never, because they wouldn't see your information. So the recruiter asked him to send it to her direct. He sent it to her directly and he got an interview from that, okay? Uh, so that works. Another example is I had an HR person at Career Education Corporation who landed an HR manager job, and he posted on LinkedIn um, how excited he was. He got this new job, and he wants to thank everybody who helped him, and he especially wants to help the person who helped bring his resume to the top of the list. And I called him up, and I said, hey, Dan, it's Steve Rosenblum. And he says, I knew you'd get that, because he used this three-by-three follow-up method, Okay. And it works. Again, the, the trick is trying to get to someone who can get a response for you. If you call the, the vice president of the department that you're applying for, right? And that's not the hiring manager, nor is it the recruiter, but it's someone that you've left a voicemail for, right? And that person calls recruiting or the hiring manager and says, listen, I just got a phone call from Steve Rosenblum. He says he applied for the, the HR manager position. Um, can someone get back to him, right? You think you're gonna get a call or, or some response? You'll get some response. Again, it might not be the response you want, but it's gonna be a response. Now you need to be cautious of this wheel, okay? Because this wheel can start spinning very quickly right? You make initial contact, you wait three business days, maybe not only are you following up in that yellow box, but also uh, the, the number one follow-up, but also you're applying for maybe two more jobs that day. You found two more jobs online. Now, three days from then, you're not only following up on the first jobs that you applied for or the networking that you've done, but now you've got more that you added to it. Three days later after that, you have even more on there. So don't like, for instance, don't apply for 10 jobs a day because you will find that the follow-up starts to pile on top of each other every three days 
and you really want to be cautious of the time that you're taking trying to make those phone calls and networking and applying for jobs and maybe hopefully interviewing, right? So set yourself apart from everybody else who's applying for jobs and use follow-up to do your job search, okay? Eventually your dead file is gonna get bigger than your active file and that's okay. I completely understand that, um, but it's going to get you some results, okay? Create your own spiel that comes from you so you can feel comfortable and it, it's easy for you to say, um, but that's my spiel and I guarantee you it will get you activity and it will get you results, okay? Jessica, you wanna come back to me? All right. Do, 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 do. Hopefully you can see me back again. Yes. All right, great. Yes. All right. So you're doing all this follow-up. Hopefully you're getting interviews and things like that. Something else I want you to do is if something isn't working for you, tweak it for you, okay? Um, I also want you to continuously track your progress, right? Um, if things are going crazy and you have too much on your plate, slow down. It's okay. If you're thinking I can add a little bit more on my plate, try doing that as well, okay? So a lot of information I know I shared. Remember about the, especially some takeaways, places you can look for work, uh, the three formats of your resume, um, the, the three by three follow-up, please use that. I had a guy, I went to a Christmas party downtown one day and uh, I had a guy come running up to me who heard my presentation about three by three. And he said, not only did it help him find a job, he got a job in sales. He uses my three by three follow-up method every day in his job. It works, it works. So my last slide before we get to questions is my contact information. Please feel free, take a screenshot, write it down, whatever. Um, my LinkedIn is on here as well. Um, I encourage you to join me on LinkedIn about 80% of my contacts are HR people in the Chicago area that might be able to help you with your job search as well. And um, I'll link with you for a, a little bit, maybe two weeks or more uh, that gives you access to my contacts, but make sure you say how you met me um, and I'll give you access to those. Those are all people who know me, right? It's like 300 and something or 400 and something. I'm not a big uh, LinkedIn connector because I want people who I'm connected with to know me and find value in those introductions. So please take advantage of that. All right, Jessica, over to you. It looks like we have some people in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for all those wonderful tips, tips and tricks. Um, yeah, there's a question about um, going back to the business card and putting your address on there. Do you really think that that's uh, what's the value in that if you have your like phone number or LinkedIn? Great question. So at least put your city and state on there, okay? Um, because if someone's applying for a job, let's say in Tinley Park, which is on the south side, right? And your business card says you live in Gurney, which is way up north, right? That's kind of important for them to know at least where in the, in the area you live. Uh, they don't necessarily have to know your street address, right? I also tell people, don't put your street address on your resume. Nobody's going to come knocking on your door to, to, you know, to work with you on your job search or, you know, to hand you an offer letter. Um, that'll all come on the employment application. But where you live, as far as at least city and state, is very helpful. And there was a question of, um, you know, sometimes they're like... Uh, recruiters names aren't listed or maybe there's a multiple recruiting team that's working. Um, can you go over again how to um, get a recruiter's name? So that's really hard. Like um, Walgreens is a tough nut to crack, 
right? You call the main number and say, hi, I applied for this job. And their answer is, oh, we have several recruiters. I'm sure they're going to look at your resume and, you know, respond if they're interested. And I'm like, that's not what I wanted to hear, right? <laughs> so, so sometimes that's hard. You just have to do your research in like LinkedIn, right? Or Google, but my preference is LinkedIn. And you can put in keywords, you can put in the company and scroll through, um, you know, by position or by department. And like I said, also, um, you know, if you just can't find the person who's recruiting for that job, call the head of the department that you applied for, right? If you applied for a position in human resources, call the head of HR. If you applied for a position in finance, you can call the head of finance. Call the CFO, right? Because if that's not the appropriate person, either the switchboard or the, the administrator for that person or that person themselves will try to forward you to the right person. If let's say you apply for a job in HR and you call the head of the HR department, maybe at a location or the company, they may say, oh, hold on, Mary's recruiting for that. Let me transfer you to Mary, right? Um, especially if that's somebody in that department, maybe a hiring manager, they can help point you in the right direction. You don't always need to call the recruiter. You can call who you think may be the hiring person. And if they don't want to take your call, they'll have you contact the recruiter. Excellent. Um, there was a question. If I'm sending cover letters and resumes, hopefully directly to high level execs, I don't suspect I'll be able to call and follow up with them. Who is the next best person to try and contact? Perhaps their executive assistant? So call that person. <laughs> if, if, they're, if they're a high enough level that they have an executive assistant, when you call that person, you'll get their executive assistant. Right. And tell that person why you're calling. Right. Mm -hmm. And they may be great. Let me get your information or, you know, that person's not in right now. Can I transfer you to their voicemail? Right. Or that person may even say, great. You know what? Um, he's not available to take your call. Let me transfer you to the person who's recruiting or to our HR department or something like that. So I tell people go for the gusto. Don't feel like, you know, I'm applying for an accounting job. I'm going to contact the CFO. Well, depending on the size of the company too, go for it, right? Because that will get you in and then hopefully route you to the best person. Excellent advice. Um, I also want to make a plug for our alumni LinkedIn group and our, and our Roosevelt page, our like university page where you can search for alumni by the companies they're working for. So, you know, ask for a coffee chat, which is just like an informational interview um, through LinkedIn, like for five minutes of someone's time to say, can you tell me more about this company? I've applied for the X job and I just want to hear more about your experience. Typically you're not going to hear a no. Um, especially if you say like, I'm a fellow Laker, you know, like I want to be, you know, at this company. Um, there was a question about the ATS system. I know you shared about the text files, but is there anything else you can share about, um, how to maneuver the applicant tracking systems? Really, that's my advice. Oh, another reason you want to use a text file. Some applicant systems will say copy and paste your resume in this box. Yes. Don't ever do it from a Word doc. Okay. That is the number one reason why it comes across to me on the other side as the world's longest run on sentence, because that box will reformat mm -hmm. your Word doc. It's awful that's 100% where you copy and paste your text file resume. So you open the text file, highlight the whole thing, copy, open up the applicant system, go to that box, paste it, and send it away, okay? Um, you just really, you know, they're looking for keywords. A lot of people think about those things, right? So make sure you have those keywords in your resume, okay? Um, that you think are really, really important. I do a lot of resume reviews for folks. There's churches and networking groups, and I know Roosevelt University and the Career Services Department will also uh, help with resume reviews and give you some, some tricks and tidbits on, on how to write a good resume to be able to maneuver into that applicant tracking system. Um, but that's really important as well. Thank you. Well, thanks for, thanks for being here today. Um, I want to make sure everybody gets off to their next meetings, but thanks so much, um, Steve. And um, for the audience members, please do contact um, Steve. I'll send out um, a thank you note with his Gmail account and LinkedIn. So do connect and take advantage of this 
short window he's um, allowing you to have with his with his network. Um, that might just be the the contact you need to get into the company you want to be at. So um, you can reach us at alum at roosevelt.edu if you have ideas for um, future YPA events. And I will also post here in the chat how to connect with the alum group and our Facebook page. Um, also, I mean, you have a network of 120,000 people who've um, walked in your shoes uh, through our network and um, are here and available to help you along with our career services and other such networking opportunities we have in the future. So um, again, thank you so much, Steve. I learned a lot and I hope I, there's some great tips, especially like the, the conference volunteer tip, uh, because often those, especially when you start out, uh, you know, are priced too high for someone to take to optionally go to a conference, but being a volunteer is excellent way in. So thank you for that. And I know a lot of people here on the call have been saying thank you. So we appreciate your time. And Dina, thank you for um, connecting us with Steve. So have yes. a great rest of your day, everyone. And we will see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Take Jessica. Care. Thanks, Dina.